right, I'm going to talk about Multiflora Rose, aka Rosa Multiflora. That's a perennial plant, uh, rose bush, as you can see by the genus. Uh, it's currently becoming a problem, has been a problem, in uh, the United States, especially in the Midwest. Uh, origin, history, and location. So it originated in Japan. It was brought here to the U.S. in 1866 as rootstock. You don't really need to know exactly what that is if you don't already understand it. Pretty much just means that the roots were used in grafting with other ornamental flowers. But it really became promoted by the U.S. government in the 1900s. Uh, first, in the 1930s, with the U.S. Soil Conservation Service, they promoted it to farmers, saying that it was good for erosion control and used as a livestock fence. So, you know, hey, you got some erosion on your land, you want a way to keep your livestock in without building a fence, you can just plant these uh, multiflora rose bushes. And then again, in the 1970s, 60s, sorry, 1960s, state conservation departments individually began promoting it as wildlife cover and food source because birds, certain birds and um, rabbits uh, enjoyed eating it or living near it. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough just promoting it, they actually started giving out free <laughs> starters of the plant to farmers to make it even more prolific. So that's a problem because now it's classified as a noxious weed in some Midwestern states. There are some uses for it still. Uh, with most rose plants, um, you can forage the flower or the rose hips to be used in tea and salads. And it is planted in highway medians for control with light and to serve as um, kind of a barrier or wildlife cover, that kind of thing. So it thrives in sunny areas with well-drained soil, though it is pretty resilient to certain environmental and soil conditions. So we see it a lot in stream banks, pastures, roadsides, woodlands, and any recently disturbed areas. Because um, it's, it's pretty resilient, it can grow in a lot of different places, but it does fail in dry habitats or in standing water. So what makes it invasive? Just being from Japan isn't a crime. You know, we have several introduced species that aren't really much of a problem. But what classifies it as invasive is that it does some sort of damage to natives or to the community. Um, like it shouldn't be there, it's a problem. Uh, and we see that with the spread and reproduction. So invasive species are typically really prolific. And this is definitely prolific with the larger plants producing 500,000 to 1 million seeds per year. And they also can reproduce by suckering, which is when another branch comes out of the roots and, you know, creates almost a second plant. Um, so the seeds, they're dispersed, uh, dispensed, whatever, by birds, mice, etc., um, and what makes it interesting is the fact that while they're in the digestive systems of these animals, the seed's germination is actually enhanced by that process. So these birds and mice are spreading it just by eating it. And those seeds remain viable in the soil for up to 20 years. Let's say you, you pick some rose hips from this plant and you put them in a jar and you forget about them. And 19 years later, oh no, I dropped my jar in my field and forgot about it. Well, that can grow into a full plant. 20 years is not too long for them. Um, so why is that prolific behavior so problematic? It's because it forms these dense thickets that outcompete native species. They're replacing the natives and inhibiting tree regeneration by, you know, eating up all those nutrients and blocking out sunlight. They form these thorny thickets that cause a problem for farmers and foresters uh, because they're actually really damaging. They can puncture tires and inflict some pretty nasty gashes. And if you're a livestock owner, it's also even more problematic because it diminishes your pasture forage your cow wants to go out there and eat some luscious grass, well he can't because there's multiflora rose covering up half your land and he can't eat that and it's choking out all the natives and it's just a problem. Um, and because it changes kind of the makeup of the habitat, that can be a problem for your pickier nesting birds. Okay, so now you know it's bad. Uh, you know you have to get rid of it, but before you can get rid of it, you have to know what it looks like. So we'll talk about some identification. Here I have a little list of some things that make it stand out. So it's got clusters of small white flowers Hairier fringe stipules at the base of each leaf stalk, long arching stems called canes on very large plants that are up to 15 feet tall and 15 feet wide. That's pretty big. And their thorns are backwards curved and very sharp. Like I said, they've punctured tires before. All right, first we'll look at the flowers. Uh, they're pretty small, as you can see, this compared to his thumbnail. Pretty, pretty darn small on the smaller end. They bloom from May to June. And they're not always white, but they always have five petals. Sometimes they're a little pinkish, but I think these, these five petals and then this kind of structure, the way it looks in the middle, makes it pretty distinct. Um, you know, it looks just like a lot of rose leaves in the fact that um, they're kind of spiky. See how they're serrated edges and oval shaped? Well, if we're going to talk about the structure of the leaf, um, 
it's actually uh, pairs of leaflets on one main leaf, which means it's, it's a compound leaf. So it has a central stem, which you can see here, this is the central stem, and then the leaflets come off from either side uh, in pairs. And so where you see this start, this uh, base of the leaf stench, which is fringed and very distinct, where you see that start, that's the beginning of the whole leaf. And these leaves, these entire leaves, they're arranged in an alternate structure, which means you'll never see two of them directly across from one another. There's that little space in between them and they're on opposite sides. That's alternate branching. Uh, one more, I guess, little detail. Um, I mean, the, the fringed leaf stem should be the most distinctive part. You won't mix that up with any other roses if you look at how unique that is. Uh, but they do have tiny hairs on the underside, which you can see is a bit lighter than the top of the leaf. Okay, thorns. Pretty distinct. They usually come in pairs. As you can see here, it's got like a white color and it's pretty, pretty nasty. Pretty solid looking. I wouldn't want to put my hand on that. And this is a picture of it without any leaves or anything. Just what the bark looks like. These stems are called canes. They, they look like canes. Um, and they're usually green or reddish in color. You see a reddish one here and a green one there. So the other part, it's the fruit. These are called rose hips. Um, they last all winter and they become kind of leathery. And these, these suckers are only one-fourth of an inch in size. All right, we know they're bad. We know how to find them. Let's talk about getting rid of them. I have this chart here about control methods. We're just going to look at manual slash mechanical for now. So that would be um, digging and uprooting, prescribed fire, or repeated or cutting and mowing, which you'd have to do three to six times per growing season for two to four years. And so any of these can take place in the spring, the summer, or the fall. Um, as you can see here, he has a weed wrench, um, it's kind of like a crowbar for getting rid of weeds. You grab it, you pull. Um, I mean, if you're getting rid of large amounts of this stuff, though, you're going to want to use a tractor. So people, you know, they tie a chain to it, get their tractor, and they yank it right out of the ground. Once you've yanked them out of the ground, you've got to get rid of them through burning or chipping because, again, they can reproduce by suckering. It's not just seeds. If you leave these laying around, you might have some stray plants coming out. They can get back in the ground. So burns are actually known to be pretty effective, though, so that's good. All right, we're going to look at chemical and biological. Um, there's cut stump application. You put your chemicals on this. You cut it. You put the chemicals on the stump kills it you do that oh you do that in the late summer fall or winter um because in the spring you know it doesn't really hinder them at all like just keep growing foliar application that's when you put it on the leaves foliar foliage here's some instances of what you can put on there um based on the chemical you'll either use it in the summer in the fall or in the spring so there is also basil bark application um some chemicals you put directly onto the bark uh, which you do in the fall and the winter. And what's interesting about basil bark application is that it's typically only effective with plants that are um, having a trunk diameter of six feet or less if you're standing at like an adult male's breast height, this DBH diameter breast height. So that's the diameter of the plant at the breast height of your average adult male. So because these canes are really thin, that is effective for getting rid of um, your multiflora rose. Uh, there's also the opportunity of biological removal, but that's not yet available because these are still under study. Both of these things, the European rose chalcid, which is an insect that comes from Europe, and rose rosette disease, which is a natural virus. This natural virus is actually um, a viral pathogen that's spread by native mites. Both of these cause damage to all rose species, including native ones. So we're not using those at all yet in this country because that would damage our native species. Um, so honestly, all these things are known to be pretty effective. The foliar application, cut stump, and manual or mechanical, but because these seeds last for 20 years, you'd, you'd have to keep monitoring, coming, coming back and checking on things every year, even after your two to four years here, or however long it takes these. Um, basil bark, that's known to be effective too. There's some, some plant growth regulators people will apply either to the leaves or to the cut stems um, in order to prevent the fruit from growing. Um, some of those are pretty effective, but then some of them are best used as a cocktail with other chemicals, as chemical control methods typically are best used with other ones. So that's your multiflora rose. I've got some sources here. I'll put a link in the description if you want to check out the slideshow for yourself. Um, uh, good luck studying.